for this last plenaries of uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, the last plenary of today is actually a very core and key theme of this whole conference and we hope to have a uh, really good presentation and also discussion. We have very uh, distinguished speakers who have worked on these issues for a long time. Today's uh, panel, uh, this plenary title is Democracy Under Capitalism and Socialism. Uh, we have three speakers, Michael Lebovich, Pradeep uh, Gavli, and Ravi Sinha. And Professor G. Hargopal will be chairing the session. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Professor G. Hargopal. Professor Hargopal, distinguished political scientist, is currently ICSSR National Fellow with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad. He was with the University of Hyderabad as a professor in the Department of Political Science and later in the Center for Human Rights. He was also a visiting professor at CSS EIP, NLSIU, Bangalore. He is a well-known human rights activist. He was with APCLC for several years and played an important role in conflict resolution between the state and the Naxal groups. He has published extensively in EPW and several other journals written for both the Telugu and English, English press for human rights and political economic issues. I uh, hand over the session to Professor Hargopal. No friends, uh, <clears throat> welcome to this uh, very important uh, session on uh, democracy in capitalism and socialism, an unresolved uh, question and I think it is also a civilizational challenge because between two isms, democracy seems to have been caught up and I think this uh, session will be very important uh, session because very distinguished uh, persons with a lot of experience and insight will be making their presentation. Michael Leibovich is a professor emeritus of economics at Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, Canada and heads a program on transformative practice and human development at the center, Centro International Miranda, Venezuela. His books include Build It Now, Socialism for the 21st Century. Beyond Capital, Marx, Political Economy of the Working Class, which won the Dusher Memorial Prize in 2004. He is currently working on two books, The Socialist Alternative, Real Human Development, and a volume on Karl Marx from Palgrave Macmillan's Greatest Economy series. So I am very happy to introduce Michael Lebovis, and I request him to make his presentation. The other two panelists include Ravi Sinha, he is an activist scholar and a leading member of the New Socialist Initiative. He has been associated with the left movement for nearly four decades, trained as a theoretical physicist. He has a doctoral degree from MIT Cambridge, USA. He worked as a physicist at the University of Maryland, College Park, USA at Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad and the Gujarat University, Ahmedabad. He is the principal author of the book Globalization of Capital, published by Lal Parcham and Lok Dasta in 1997, and a co-founder of the highly acclaimed social science Hindi Santan. I am reminded of J.D. Bernal, who was a physicist who wrote not only a very interesting book on physics, the expansion of man, but he also has written a book on history of social sciences. I think this is one of those rare combinations of a scientist who is interested not only in science, but in the larger social systems and the way that systems develop. Because his book, Globalization of Capital, perhaps has nothing directly to do with the physics, but it has a lot to do with the development of science and technology. The third speaker is Pradeep Gaiwali. Gaiwali is a well-known politician of Nepal, affiliated with the leftist student movement in, the, in his early days. 
he left his college to join the pro democratic movement in 1979 and worked as an underground political activist until 1990 when the movement got success and the multi party democracy was established he was elected for two consecutive terms in parliament from constituency number 2 of gulmi district and served as mp since 1999 to 2012 before the dissolution of the constituent assembly he was the minister for culture tourism and civil aviation 2006 2007 he played an influential role in nepali peace process to end the decade long violent conflict he led various panels to investigate the big corruption scandals of government agencies currently agency he works as the chief of central department of publicity of party and editor in chief of party organ navayug he is a columnist in national newspapers and author of eight books now i think you know you would make out from the the details of these three distinguished speaker that they have a lot they have people with um, experience in the movements people who participate in the underground movement we have a scholar who has written so I mean extensively on capital and socialism. I think we are looking forward to these presentations which will provide us very deep uh, insight into the whole systems and the social system, working of the system, dynamics of the system. May I now request uh, <coughs> Michael uh, to make his presentation. Sir, we may take about 20 minutes. Well, I want to thank you very much, uh, G. Hargapal. Um, let me indicate that the description is, is the old description. I'm not at uh, in Venezuela uh, anymore, um, and I didn't um, write the book on Marx um, that had been uh, advertised there because I decided it was for a capitalist press and the prices were too high. Um, so I instead wrote books on the uh, four month review press and they're all available here now um, on um, the socialist alternative and um, following Marx and also the last book being Contradictions of Real Socialism, The Conductor and the Conducted. I, I want to thank very much the organizers of the conference. It's only as the days go by that I realize more and more the significance and importance of this conference, especially in this time in Telangana. Um, so that's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here on this occasion. I also want to thank them for placing me on this particular panel um, because um, it wasn't a subject that I had specifically thought about and it forced me to rethink a number of questions and which is always exciting um, but on the other hand it means that my paper was uh, is still in a process and some of my notes some of the pages I'll read from are just filled with arrows and things in the margin etc like that so I don't know whether I'll be able to decipher this but what I want to talk about is um, three perspectives on democracy everyone agrees that democracy is a good thing but democracy means different things to different people. And how those views differ depends on their particular premises. So I want to identify three different um, general premises and then consider democracy in that light. The first perspective, individual's freedom to choose is the value to be maximized. The second perspective is the coordination of individuals should be maximized in order to advance the interests of all and to avoid disharmony and dysfunction. And the third perspective is the development of human capacities is the value to be maximized. And I call these three perspectives consumer choice, the orchestra conductor, and revolutionary practice. Let's consider the first of these, the consumer choice perspective. The argument is made that we are free if we have complete freedom to choose. If we as individuals can choose whatever we want, if we can choose whatever job we want, if we can vote for whatever candidate or party we want, we are free. The argument is that in each, ca in, in each case, the starting point is the atomistic, isolated individual who is free to choose. 
From this perspective, unfreedom and dictatorship exists if we are restricted in our ability to choose commodities, jobs, and candidates in an election. That is the ideological perspective of democracy and capitalism. Every individual appears free if they, if they can choose. But it's important to distinguish between that appearance and the underlying inner structure, the essential underlying structure. For example, consider the choice of a job. The, this position would say that if you feel free, if, that if, if you are free to move to another job, you can't be exploited. You can choose to go elsewhere. However, in fact, in the capitalist workplace, as a result of the sale of labor power, capital determines the purpose of production, it has authority over the worker in the workplace, and it owns the products of labor. There is no freedom in the capitalist workplace. Rather, there is the dictatorship of capital. And the freedom to move from job to job is the freedom to seek a different capitalist exploiter, a different dictator. In other words, you can be free to choose, but what is there to choose from? What is the choice set? Consider choice in the market. Marx's comment on Marx's market exchange was that despite the overall dependence on one another, the social connection of people is in fact the connection of, quote, mutually indifferent persons, end of quote. In other words, the connections through the market appears as in external to the individuals and independent of them. That's a quote from the Grundrisse. So consider what happens when, with people who function in the market as producers. The appearance is that these in isolated and indifferent individuals take the data from that social connection, the market, and are free to choose to seek their own self-interest. We choose. We are the masters of our fate. Marx's point, though, was that we were in fact dominated by our social connection, dominated by the market. These seemingly independent individuals, he argued, are in fact ruled by the market. They are ruled by abstractions, he said. Abstractions which are, quote, nothing more than the theoretical expressions of those material relations which are their lord and master, end of quote. In fact, we are driven by the market. We are driven by the need for money, this, the real need that, that capitalism creates. And if the market tells us we will get the money we need by engaging in a particular act, we do so. Marx's comment was seemingly individual, independent individuals are in fact subject to, quote, complete dependence on the so-called world market, close quote. And we need to stress that that market is dominated by those who have the most money. Those individuals who are free to choose, individuals are choose, free to choose, but the choice set, in other words, what there is to choose from, is dominated by those who have capital. Finally, consider the seemingly independent of the individuals in the process of voting. Here, the choice set is also a function of those who have money. Those who control the media, those who control the banks, the firms, they choose the candidates who can win. And again, there is the question of who determines the choice set. Um, we can, of course, always choose to vote for somebody who has no chance to vote to, uh, to win, but of course, the choice set has been established not by us. Um, so in other words, what we can see is the different, this apparent freedom of these seemingly independent individuals is certainly real for those individuals, but it is in fact domination by the power of capital. The appearance of individual freedom is indeed central to the reproduction of those mutually independent, mutual, mutually indifferent persons. And the key is always to ask in all questions, what kind of people are produced in this relation? Indeed, the kind of people produced in this relation are mutually, indi you know, mutually indifferent people. So the appearance of democracy as the individual ability to choose plays a central ideological role in capitalism. Um, and we always have to look below the appearance to the underlying structure and how that underlying structure is reproduced. Consider the second perspective, the orchestra conductor. This perspective entirely rejects a, a focus on isolated animistic individuals. It focuses instead on the collective unity of individuals and on the importance and necessity to coordinate those individuals. Marx, in this respect, stressed the necessity of a directing authority to ensure, quote, a harmonious cooperation of the activities of individuals. Close quote. And his metaphor for that directing authority was the orchestra conductor. The orchestra conductor is the metaphor for the need to coordinate many people. 
quote, a single violin player is his own conductor, and orchestra requires a separate one, close quote. And that job of considering the whole, Marx noted, is the special work of particular individuals. In this context, I think it is important self-perception of the conductor. And I talk about this in my book, The Contradictions of Real Socialism, The Conductor and the Conducted. For the conductor, in the words of Elias Kennedy in his book Crowds and Power, music is the only thing that counts. No one is more convinced than the conductor, quote, that his business is to serve music and to interpret it faithfully, close quote. In other words, the perspective of the conductor is, I am necessary. Without me, there would be chaos. So consider what the per democracy is in this particular perspective in practice. Democracy in this case is the right to participate collectively in discussions and to offer suggestions which can improve a predetermined course of actions. In other words, democracy here is collective participation sometimes considerable participation, but not participation in the development of the goal. Rather, it is the opportunity to comment and to approve the plan of the conductor. Let me give you examples. Consider the place of trade unions in the Soviet Union. Their principal function was to serve as a transmission belt from the state to the workers in order to support mobilize workers to support state goals. And that was set out explicitly in Article 96 of the fundamental labor legislation of the Soviet Union. Article 97 of that labor legislation noted the right of workers to take part in discussions and, quote, to submit proposals on improving the work of enterprises, institutions, and organizations, close quote. In other words, workers had the right to make suggestions. Um, and that article continued, Quote, well, the officials of enterprises, institutions, organizations must promptly consider proposals made by factory workers and office employees and then inform them regarding the steps taken on these matters, close quote. Now, there's not much power of workers to decide in that process. Rather, it's the basic perspective is the company will be happy to receive suggestions from the workers and the company will decide which ones, if any, it will follow. A more recent example of this concept of democracy as consultative participation was the very extensive discussions in Cuba on the lineamentos, the guidelines, the guidelines for the party, circulated for the party, which have functioned now as the basis for the new directions being taken in Cuba. These guidelines circulated by the party and everyone was mobilized for these discussions. They were mobilized in workplaces, in communities, in neighborhoods, in, in organizations, everywhere. People were discussing the lineamentos. Um, the party coordinated these discussions in each separate location on the base, and on the basis of these reports, there were adjustments. For example, there was a great expression of concern in many discussions about the phasing out of the libretta, the list of sub subsidized goods which was the party was moving to, to remove. Um, and the clear opposition to that, concern about that, significantly slowed down that process. Um, more recently in Cuba, new labor, a new labor code was established, and that involved extensive discussion of a document prepared by the party uh, sent to the, the uh, CTC, the, uh, the Cuban Labor Federation. Um, and in this case, there was extensive participation um, here in, in a process of transmitting uh, the concerns from below and adjusting you know, to the nature of those concerns. But there were extensive limits. In the labor code, for example, there was no place for a general discussion of worker management. Um, there was no means from one community to communicate to another community about their concerns about, for example, worker management. Uh, there was a kind of collective atomism that existed in that particular case. The perspective of the conductor is that he knows the whole score, that he alone knows that score, and therefore uh, activity outside that score is to be discouraged. One community wanted to discuss uh, the whole question of professionalization of sports. It was not allowed to have that discussion. Um, the logic, too, of the conductor is there can only be one conductor. 
Um, and also the logic of the conductor is that if there are differences among the, those at the top, they should be hidden because all this would create confusion among those below. There is absolutely no doubt that the extensive discussions such as existed in Cuba are very important. Um, and it, you know, they, they distinguish the Cuban process from the Soviet process, etc. However, that participation in this case is not an opportunity, it's not the same as the opportunity to develop one's capacity through protagonism and through protagonistic democracy. And we have to ask, what kind of people are produced here in this case, in this relation? Uh, not what Marx called rich human beings, that rich individuality, which is all cited in its capabilities. Um, in the Soviet Union, we could see that that kind of process did not build the, the protagonistic subjects who have the strength and power to prevent the restoration of capital, capitalism. This brings us to the third perspective, revolutionary practice. The concept of revolutionary practice comes from Marx's third thesis on Feuerbach. Um, and it was specifically oriented toward uh, Robert Owen, who was praised here the other day. And that was a critique. Marx was critiquing here an approach which said that if we change circumstances for people, then that will lead to a change in their nature. And Marx's comment was, this doctrine, quote, forgets that it is man who changes circumstances and that the educator must himself be educated. Hence, this doctrine is bound to divide society into two parts, one of which is superior to society, close quote. And then came the key statement, the one that is the statement of revolutionary practice, quote, the coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-change can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice, close quote. And Marx was entirely consistent on this point throughout his life. This combination of the change of circumstances and self-change is the red thread that runs through all his work. Uh, workers struggle in order to change circumstances. They change themselves at the same time. They make themselves fit to build a new world. And it is not only workers' struggles that lead to these two changes, circumstances and changing human beings. Every activity has two products, uh, the, the, the material product and the human product. It is very clear, for example, in the sphere of production that every activity has two products, the material product and a joint product, which is the human being who is engaged in production. For example, under capitalist relations of production, there is a growth of material output, but there's also a human product. That human product Marx was so clear is on was a fragmented, crippled human being, crippled by the separation of head and hand. Um, very simply, he talked about how production under capitalist relations of production destroys human beings, destroys nature. Um, and one aspect of the destruction of human beings was the alienated production, which leaves workers empty in the process of production, an emptiness which they feel can only be filled by the desire to have things. Uh, in other words, consumerism is not an accident in capitalism. Well, one can talk about this you know, uh, process and see what was happening in, in, in Marx, how Marx described uh, capitalist production, but he also, in Capital, described an alternative. It's hidden there. It's present there, though. And that is, he talked about the inverse relation in which means of production are used to serve what he called, quote, the worker's own need for development. And when you see him talk about this inverse relationship, you start to say, where else does he talk about inverse relationship? And you see he talks about capitalism is an inversion. Capitalism has means of production, hire workers, employ workers. We must invert that inversion and have workers employ means of production, not the capitalist inversion. Um, and that is this general perspective, because when we think in terms of that inverted society, a society in which workers you know, control the process of production to produce things which allow for the satisfaction of the workers' own need for development, we can see an entirely, you know, the, the, that the concept of the alternative is present in Marx's capital. Working under capitalist, under new relations of production, under the relations of associated producers, produces a different human being, a different human product. And Marx says explicitly in Capital, 
quote, when the worker cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off his individuality and develops the capabilities of his species. In other words, the key link here of human development and practice uh, points to the importance of protagonism in the workplace, protagonism in the communities, protagonism everywhere. This is how rich human beings, in Marx's view, are produced. And that is what Marx's concept of socialism was all about. The creation of a society which allows for the full development of human beings, the full development of human capacities. With socialist relations of production, or the relations of associated producers, there is what Marx called in the critique of the Gotha program, the all-around development of the individual, and the result is that all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly. This view is precisely the perspective of socialism for the 21st century as it has emerged in Latin America. This focus on human development and practice, this key link, is that you know, concept, and it distinguishes the concept of socialism for the 21st century from the theory and the experience of, of, of 20th century attempts at building socialism. We see it very clearly in the sections of the Bolivarian Constitution of Venezuela. Uh, the first act of Chavez after his 1998 election was to call for the Constituent Assembly a, a new constitution was written with the very strong participation of the social movements. And if you look at that constitution, you see the, its explicit goal is, quote, ensuring overall human development, end of quote. There's a focus on, quote, creating the, developing the creative potential of every human being and the full exercise of his or her personality in a democratic society, close quote. There is the quote, the statement that, that quote, everyone has the right to be free to the free development of his or her own personality. That is the human development side of this constitution. And the practice side is also there. It's there in the declaration that participation by people is, quote, the necessary way of achieving the involvement to ensure their complete development, both individual and collective, close quote. The necessary way. Without that, you cannot have human development without that protagonism. That's the statement in that Bolivarian constitution. And that constitution also goes on to talk about the importance of democratic planning, participatory budgeting, self-management, co-management, cooperatives, etc. And in many respects, when and one looks at Venezuela in the subsequent period after that constitution, you see the clear attempt to realize that. You see the clear attempt to realize that, especially in the development of the communal council, where people participate on their local level, making local decisions, and are transformed in that very process. And you could see Chavez's orientation to move this into the sphere of, of work as well. At one point he said in one of his open cabinet meetings, what we have now is state capitalism without worker control. You cannot have socialism. Um, so what you can see in this, you know, process is that central to the concept of socialism for the 21st century is protagonistic democracy. Protagonistic democracy in the workplace, protagonistic democracy in the community, protagonist democracy throughout the society. Because that is precisely the necessary way to ensure the complete human development, both individual and collective. And, well, Chavez did not at all begin thinking of himself as a socialist. And when he did, you know, move considerably to the left, he was propelled by what Marx called slaveholders' result, revolts, which put the sword in the hand of the social revolution. Uh, he did not immediately start talking about socialism. He began simply to talk about how capitalism is perverse, a perverse society, and he contrasted that for a year with what he called the social economy. The social economy cares about people, puts human beings at, you know, at its core, is oriented toward use value, not exchange value. He was talking about socialism for at least a year before he actually took, used the term socialism. And then he used that term socialism at the World you know, Social Forum in, in January 2005 in Porto Alegre, where he said, it can, we, we have to reinvent socialism. It can't be the kind of socialism we saw in the Soviet Union, but it will emerge as we develop new systems that are based on cooperation, not competition. And he continued, quote, but we cannot resort to state capitalism, which be the same perversion of the Soviet Union. We must reclaim socialism as a thesis, 
a project and a path, but a new type of socialism, a humanist socialism, which puts humans and not machines or the state ahead of everyone. Now, one should not think it's only Chavez that we can look at, because I want to read you a long, lengthy statement made by the Vice President of Bolivia, um, Alvaro um, <laughs> Garcia Linera. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Garcia Linera made this speech to the meeting of the Party of the European Left in Madrid last December where he said, uh, among other things, that faced with modern capitalism's predatory and destructive capacity, the European left and the worldwide left must come forward with proposals, with initiatives. It is up to us, the left in Europe and throughout the world, to build a new common feeling. And he continued, we must recover the concept of democracy. The left has always waved this banner. It's our banner, the banner of justice, equality of participation. However, for all that, we must free ourselves from a purely institutional conception of democracy. Democracy is much more than institutions. It is much more than voting and electing a parliament. It is much more than observing the rules of alternation of ins and outs. We are prisoners of a liberal, fossilized conception of democracy. Democracy means the values, the organizational principles of understanding the world, tolerance, pluralism, freedom of opinion, freedom of association. It is true that these are principles, values, but they are not solely principles and values. They are institutions, but not solely. Democracy is practice, a collective action. It consists of increasingly taking part in the management of the common areas of society. There is democracy if we take part in the common good. If our heritage is water, then democracy is taking part in the management of water. If our heritage is a language, then democracy is defending that common good. If our heritage is forest, lands, knowledge, then democracy is managing, administering them in common. We must have an increasing participation in the management of forests, water, air, natural resources. Democracy exists living not as fossilized democracy if the population and the land they're taking part in the management of houses, institutions, rights, and riches. The old socialists in the 1970s said democracy should knock at the factory gates. That's a good idea, but it's not enough. As well as knocking at the factory gates, it must knock at the doors of banks, firms, institutions, resources, everything that belongs to the people. And he ends this section by saying we need to, you know, begin with the, the growing participation of citizens in the management of the commonwealth of the whole of society, of the whole region. Well, back to the plenary theme. Democracy under capitalism and socialism. Democracy under capitalism is a real form of appearance, but its underlying essence is dictatorship. Democracy under socialism, in contrast, must be based on the protagonism that transforms both circumstances and human beings, and does so in such a way as to satisfy the worker's own need for development. We need to build a society, a society of associated conductors. And so let me end by simply pointing, quoting a statement, a slogan that was originated with the uh, South African Communist Party, which apparently has forgotten the slogan. Uh, that is, socialism is the future, build it now. It has been indeed uh, very refreshing because this paper has gone back to fundamentals which I think uh, in the current uh, global model almost have been forgot. So the one question that uh, his lecture uh, raises is uh, what exactly is the relation between individual and the collective. Uh, normally when we discuss in human rights the logical limit of individual freedom is anarchy and logical limit of collective or common good is despotism. Now, how do you draw a line where uh, individual freedom and collective good can be so reconciled that while individual realizes meaning to life, the potential to life, at the same time the collective good does not suffer. I think this is a civilizational challenge. But he has built 
a very interesting uh, postulates and particularly when he explained the re revolutionary practice in fact uh, he is talking that democracy is not a form of government or institutional arrangement it's a transformative process human society being dynamic and human beings being created to species if they are constantly changing then the human being has to have capacity to construct or to ad adopt to the change and at the same time should be able to engage in self emancipation it's a both the struggle for democracy is self emancipation and also emancipation of the collective and work is not a source of livelihood but li work is or labor is a source of meaning to human life because human beings realize meaning to life through labor so as long as the labor work for capital there is no way that human being can realize meaning to life i think these are very fundamental questions of socialism and when he talks of the socialist democracy while he has argued that soviet union collapse because it was not a socialist democracy but it was state capitalism and state capitalism can be worse than market capitalism that i think soviet union demonstrated but the way it crumbled i think it has failed on the market on the freedom scale and it also failed on equity and justice scale i mean it's a failure on both fronts i think capitalism survived because of its own self adjustment and its own i mean ad adaptability i think socialist experiment instead of being a revolutionary practice somewhere it has drifted into state capitalism i think these are some of the very important questions so democracy in this context is the continuous revolutionary practice of human beings engaged in a struggle of changing themselves and changing their circumstances and that continuous practice should be i mean construed as the essence of democracy i think this is one of the very uh, profound formulations that uh, the paper made i think it will be open for discussion i don't know what practice you are following but i think we will take up uh, all the three presentation because all three have a common theme then we take up the debate and comments from the house now i request our friend from nepal of course uh, he is fresh from the experience i think of course he was a part of the movement he was underground then he was in the constant assembly then he was a minister and uh, of course nepal all of us were looking to this experiment but now of course it has its own ups and downs now a person with a fresh experience of uh, an experiment of socialist you know some sort of uh, you know i mean movement in uh, nepal now i request uh, uh, our uh, friend uh, pradeep uh, to make his presentation uh thank you chair distinguished panelists comrades 